Yes, so we are ready to go. It's recording. And so I'm going to let the attendees pop in. Mm -hmm. They are currently doing. Cool. And I think also what I'm going to do is, um, can you, um, yeah, can you uh, unshare for just a second? Of Sophia? course, yeah. And that of way course. I can, I'll just bring yeah. up the, the main screen here. Okay. All right, so we have like a good amount of people here. I think we can like begin, I think we feel good about mm -hmm. this. All right, so uh, hello, welcome everybody. Um, take a virtual seat. Uh, this is the first of the fall 2022 Sarah Little Turnbull Visiting Designer Speaker Series, uh, where we talk to various luminaries in the world of design, art, science, and activism, and other, other areas as well. This semester, uh, we're gonna be focusing on cross-cultural design. Uh, that is, how should user-focused designers best respond to users from different cultures? Uh, whether there really is a universal design, how do artists and designers respond to the blending of cultures? Uh, what happens when those cultures mix? What happens when they don't mix? Um, how do we best harness the dialogue between cultures? And, and also uh, from a historical perspective, like how does this mixture rever reverberate down through history? Um, this, that said, this series is running concurrently with Abhi Ayala Structural Origins, the uh, current exhibition in the Lehman College Art Gallery, uh, which uh, this semester is participating in the New York Latin American Art Triennial. And um, I, I highly recommend if you're on campus, if you're able to go, you go see this. I, I was popping in there, I guess opening night, the day before, right before they open, and it was just, it was incredible. So you really have to go see it if you're in, if you're able to and you're around. It'll be open from, uh, it opened in, on the 21st of September and we'll conclude it on January 28th. So you do, do have a good amount of time to see it, but um, I would also wanna mention and welcome the, some of the students who are in the attendee list here because this, uh, this lecture series, as is custom now, is a direct component of a design course that's currently being taught by Professor Sean Chang, who, yeah, he's here, I see him. Uh, these students are here with us today and they'll be interacting with us hopefully through the Q&A section uh, that is down at the very bottom of the screen. You'll see a little Q&A uh, button. Uh, and also I just wanna mention, this is open to the public, so, all kinds of people here, students, some faculty, some administrators, just some people who are interested in having a design conversation. Uh, so if you have any questions uh, that pop up during our discussion with, with my guest, uh, please, please, please definitely ask them in the Q&A and I'll do my best to fold them in. Um, and before I introduce um, my guest tonight, I just wanna thank Dorothy Dunn and the Sarah Little Turnbull Foundation for their generous and continued support of this program, this initiative and the art department uh, proper. It's been um, very, very important during the pandemic. And now that we're sort of unofficially out of the pandemic, more or less, it's, um, it's really incredible to be able to continue it, to have like something consistent come out of that. Um, so thank you. Um, I also just also want to thank that said uh, Bart and Deborah in the art gallery. Uh, they've been instrumental in rolling all this stuff out. Um, so thank you very much for that. Uh, so our guest, uh, Sofia Gomez is a product designer and chocolate, chocolate enthusiast from central Portugal. Uh, she, growing up, she always had an eye for detail and building or solving things to perfection. And this need quickly merged with her passion for arts and ultimately led to her becoming a product designer. She's uh, very passionate about different cultures and embracing uh, each challenge with a new client. She studied and worked in Sweden and Denmark and therefore has a love of Scandinavian design uh, and all its forms of collaboration, participation and innovation. Um, user research, participatory, participatory design, service design, social design and design ethics are some of the fields that she's really interested in. 
After volunteering in France in the sustainable development field with children, she finished her master's in Sweden uh, in design and worked in Denmark as a junior product designer. After that, she headed back to Portugal. And in early 2019, she began working with Imaginary Cloud, which is where she is now, a UX UI design and software engineering company that's in Lisbon, which is, by the way, where she's calling from now. Uh, there she quickly took off in her field. And now three years later, she is working as a senior product designer. She's a professor and lecturer at the Institute of Art, Design and Enterprise in Lisbon. And also, just in case everyone was wondering, it's 11 p.m. in, Wis in Lisbon right now. So, so Sophia, thank you for <laughs> thank you for being here so late. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Sophia, and I'm it's re I'm really thrilled to be here tonight. Thank you for coming all. Uh, thank you for for listening. Mm -hmm. um, so do you want to show us? Uh... Yes, sharing my screen here. So, yeah. Um, so um, as David was saying, I'm here today to talk about uh, cross-cultural design, uh, how to embrace cultural diversity in UX and why it matters. Uh, because it does matter. And I, I believe that it's not given uh, the needed um, attention. Um, and beyond that, I also uh, want to leave you with some um, practical tools on how to embrace it. So uh, before we dive into the practical uh, part, I want to tell you uh, a little story. So some years ago, uh, in 2008, uh, at Ethos Terminal 5, uh, there were some issues occurring uh, with older people. They were going to the toilets a lot at the airport, and uh, they, were, they were getting lost. Uh, they were nearly missing their flights or really missing their flights. And, well, um, that, that was a big issue that the airport officials started to um, realize. And well, they quickly jumped into conclusions and it was very obvious for them uh, the reason why this was happening. Um, uh, but before I tell you why this was really happening, I actually want to, um, to know what you think. Why uh, or what, what do you think is the cause of this behavior? Um, and so I ask you to head to menti.com and use the following code. Uh, there will be a multiple uh, question uh, for you there. So I'll give you some time. You can um, get your phone or laptop. It works either way. With a phone is very quick if you just scan the QR code. Um, so I'll, I'll give you a little bit of time to do so. Um, yeah. So I'm just, I'm just doing it right now too. Mm hmm and do you mind if I just read the the answers? No, no, yeah, like I can okay. I can do it too, but go oh. ahead. <laughs> oh yeah, there they are. Yeah. So because older people to a larger extent travel with diapers, like adult diapers, uh, because which that actually sounds very plausible, because older people needed to attend Nature's Call, because older people wanted to hear announcements more clearly, clearly, and because older people wanted to access water and disinfectant. Yeah. Okay. So. I'm oh, and it says to... it, it says voting is closed. Waiter asked yes. the presenter. So to I'm going to open the voting now so you yeah. can start doing it. And ah, I'll just gotcha. a countdown uh, now. So you have a minute to answer. This so you can see some answers popping up. Wow. I, I wanted, I mean, I have to say, this is a pretty cool tool, like as an aside. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yes, it's, it is. It's I mean, very difficult to get. I, I can see. Do you use this in your professional work? This this Menti tool is this helpful for user uh, research, or is it more of like a? For user research, we don't use this kind of live polling. We have uh, other tools. Uh, this one it's more specific for like live uh, results. Uh, gotcha. So gotcha. It's very practical. Yeah. I could see well, it on a game show for sure. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so, 
So we have about 15 seconds until voting closes. Yes. I wonder who the winner is going to be. <laughs> well, I won't be. <laughs> Are there any prizes? Uh, I, Do you have no, prizes? I'm sorry. For, oh. Just, just uh, participation. Right. Is there yeah. a prize? Okay. Yes. Education, right? Education, exactly. Yeah. So, um, these are the results. A little bit, you know, uh, spread answers. I'm not mm -hmm. yet saying uh, the correct one because I want to tell you how um, yeah. how at the airport they got to to the reason why this was happening. So, um, so the airport officials uh, took their assumption. So they they thought, well. It's obvious because uh, older people need to attend nature's call. Yeah, we know yeah. older people can't hold their bladders. It's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, we're going to be more, build more toilets along, you know, the different terminals and gates and so on. Well, they were built without success, uh, and so the airport realized they needed the help of um, experts in conducting research, and so uh, research. Um, conducted field research, they hired, uh, they recruited uh, older people and gave them tasks such as going to check-in, uh, from check-in to the departure gate. Um, and they realized that uh, that was happening because people, uh, older people wanted to hear announcements uh, more clearly. Uh, you know, um, airports can have very uh, high ceilings uh, mm -hmm. and hallways that are very long and the sound is not very clear so for all the people that was an issue um, yeah I, I have I have to say yeah. that like having been in airports I largely ignore the announcements because I can't hear them and I'm a you know I'm not an elderly person um, but I can I mean I imagine for elderly people like that that is primarily how they get a lot of the information um, yeah also because the other way to to get it is through screens and often they have very small letters so that's also um, yeah okay an right. issue. yeah yeah so okay. uh as we saw some most people actually got it right but yeah. other people took another assumption you know i um, i think so one other thing sorry i just think that's interesting that the, the I mean the students won right that like that they half of the, roughly half of them got it right and I'm wondering mm -hmm. if if you all you students who answered correctly if you could kind of pop into the Q and A and just say how you knew that right and I'm I'm yeah. just very interested because we're you know yeah. it, it's an interesting thing like how are they culturally aware of that when the majority of the people in this the attendees I assume are not elderly. Mm -hmm. uh, that's an, again yeah. an assumption, but I mean, it's I think it's probably a good assumption having been on campus and seeing our students. I'm wondering how they knew that. I think that's fascinating. But anyway, if you yeah. feel like sharing why you got it right, please let us know. I'd love to talk about that later. But go yeah. on. I'm sorry. <laughs> no problem. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so they ended up with this proposal that you can see at the bottom left uh, part of the slide. Uh, which are acoustic arches, it's like little structures that enable high quality sound. And they are all over the place now, and it's much more um, easy to perceive what's being uh, said on the, on the speakers. So all this to say that, you know, cross-cultural design, it's important because uh, it is a design discipline that um, goes under the principles of taking uh, you um, beyond borders and so identities. You know, uh, the idea is that you, uh, either you are a designer, a product owner, product stakeholder, or someone involved in the conception of, of a, a product space or, uh, or experience. The idea is that you are not in your bubble dictating what's best for the user. Um, the idea is that you embrace the products, uh, the products users, their context, needs, abilities, and mental models uh, according to their culture. Um, the idea is to, and 
yeah, of course, I'm speaking um, from Portugal to you right. uh, in the US, uh, and that is a specific context in itself. Um, and the idea here is that you step away uh, from a, a weird perspective, a westernized, educated, industrialized, rich, developed perspective, because there are so many assumptions uh, that we people in living uh, you know, in, in developed, uh, rich, industrialized, educated, westernized countries, um, take that um, we need to sort of like take take those glasses out and try to see the world uh, in another way. So I would say that um, one of the first things to embrace um, cultural diversity and embrace this discipline and methodologies that it brings is to focus on a more humble and empathetic approach by uh, being open to listen to another reality than your own. Um, that's that's the first thing. And well, if we think again back to the, the example, uh, the example of the airport, what happened was that um, the airport officials just generalized, like older people, they all, you know, they all use diapers or they all have some sort of um yeah physical need uh so yeah they just need to go to tell us more often but um generalization uh is really a double-edged sword so while um categorizing and generalizing uh may help us function on a daily basis you know we wouldn't have a language if each item each object each group was truly unique we wouldn't have a way to communicate and perceive things so it is important to generalize uh, but on the other hand uh, it may distort your worldview and that's the bit i want to dive into um, we can be short-sighted if we do so and um here i want to call your attention for um expressions such as us and them you know whoever us may mean uh, for me, us may mean something. Uh, it may be us, us in Portugal, or us here in Lisbon, where I am, or us, me and my group of friends, or it can mean so many things. Um, and then it's very, very um, uh, dangerous to put people in, in bags uh, and put cultures in bags and put countries, uh, you know, in such um, dichotomy between us and them them it's like everyone else and that's that's dangerous and i want to give you a a little example here um this example was actually um uh, highlighted by uh, hans rusling was was a great uh, researcher um you can see here the the reference it's from his book called factfulness which by the way i recommend everyone to read it really changed my worldview um and there are different, you know, we talk about developed and uh, underdeveloped uh, countries, but there's actually so much more diversity than just these two groups. Uh, Hans Rusling put it into four levels, being level one, um, the most or the least uh, developed countries uh, that unfortunately face uh, contexts of um, extreme poverty and so on, and level four, uh, developed uh, countries with good health and life conditions and, and such. Um, and he gives the example of, of the toothbrush. So in level one, uh, where people are in extreme poverty and have, you know, very restrictive uh, diets and so on, people use their fingers to, uh, to brush their teeth. On level two, uh, we, already, we already see scenarios such as families with a bit higher income and they can purchase a a toothbrush and however uh, they have to share one toothbrush by the whole family which is obviously not something it's far from ideal but it is the context there and on level yeah. three uh, we already see people um, or families where each person has one toothbrush um, and my point here to describe these different uses uses of uh, toothbrushes is to explain uh, one's uh, dental care and dental hygiene. So we see that actually people in level one in extreme poverty have the same um, dental um, care as um, people in level three. 
So people, so how can, you know, your own finger be sort of as good as a toothbrush? <laughs> that is because people in level three, they have access to a completely different diet and they have access to candies and sweets, yeah, but yeah. they don't have the income to, to have proper, proper dental medical care. Uh, and so we see very similar um, problems with uh, with their teeth. So you know, if if you just put all these all these different levels in one bag, you will not be able to see the difference the differences between them and how different they are. Um, um, yeah. So beware of these of these topics. Beware of when people uh, mention the majority, the majority may be 50 people or maybe 99% of the people. And that's a big difference. Yeah. Uh, and also vivid examples. Um, examples are great. I've been uh, mentioning some here, but you shouldn't use one example to explain, to justify everything, a whole um, range of, of groups, of people, of cultures. And don't assume that people are idiots. This may be a bit silly even to say, um, but don't assume I, that it's not. It's I not struggle like, with I, I struggle with that one. That's that's my. Yeah. <laughs> I need to work through that one. It, I mean, the, but, this is a, a work in progress. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It's a, it's a person. It's a personal journey for me. Um, the, by the way, the factfulness, uh, Sophia, uh, you you got me onto this book and it's an amazing book. And I think, I mean, I really do think it's important for any human to read it, but um, I definitely think it's important for designers to read it, UX designers in particular. And I put the link in the chat um, to that book mm -hmm. if anyone's interested in getting it. So right. yeah. yeah, it's great, great book. Great, great book. thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. I recommend for, for everyone. Um, yeah, any human. Exactly. Anyone yeah. with a face, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so just don't assume that, you know, if someone else doesn't have the same perspective as you, they are, they are stupid, they are idiots. Don't, yeah. don't do that. Investigate beyond that. Why, why yeah. is it that way somewhere else? Yeah. Um, and so, well, culture is intrinsically related to identity and identity is an ever-changing uh, thing. But there are some uh, dimensions uh, that we can uh, pinpoint. Um, so many things such as race, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, social class, age, religion, individual identity, and even algorithmic identity. And just to explain the, the last one, because it might yeah. be a, a bit different term that we're yeah. used to, is basically the, the tracking capa uh, capability of the web. Um, and it, yeah, to, to map us individuals as, you know, within certain bracket, uh, brackets of, of gender, social class, and so on, in order to then, um, you know, provide us also with certain information. Um, so so um, al algorithmic identity would basically be like, biometrics about who we are is that it's kind of like information metadata about us as groups or mm -hmm. yeah like if we take the example of uh, google in specific you can actually see how google um identifies maps you so okay uh, okay just an example it might identify a person as uh, between 25 and 35 years old married with kids interested in uh, gardening or I don't know yeah like, yeah okay this could be the algorithmic identity of of a person yeah um and on top of this there are, there's an another dimension that may be more related to geography that it's uh you know local regional national global identity uh, you know I may identify as a Portuguese I may identify as a European but I may also have some sort of global identity and uh, if I would ask each one of you today what's your identity or what you identify with I'm sure there will be certain things that you would clearly uh, pinpoint but there will be others that would be very hard to uh, to put it out there simply because it's like I said it's an ever-changing notion and concept um, and 
I wanted to bring a very uh, clear example of how identity may be uh, projected into um, our daily lives. And uh, this is something I noticed. So uh, moving from Portugal to Sweden, um, I noticed that the way they consume cheese was a bit different than I was used to. So uh, in Portugal, uh, usually people tend to eat cheese um, often as a starter, you know. So they grab a knife, they cut a bit of, bit of cheese and just they just eat it like that. Uh, while in Sweden, they usually produce bigger cheeses that they cut, uh, cut in chunks and then they slice them with that cheese slice as you can see there uh, and put it on their sandwiches. So this is just, you know, a very like daily life example of how um, a culture's identity might be projected. Um, here on a more, you know, UX design side and going back to the um, uh, UX, UI uh, design of things, uh, this is the South Korean and the US uh, version of, of uh, SurveyMonkey websites. And you can see here, um, that they adapted, although you can still see the branding of the, um, of the company, uh, there, are, there are differences in it. Uh, in one, you have a, um, a static photo. Uh, in the other one, you have a video. Um, and well, although on the Korean one, I, I believe that most of you might not understand, the actual uh, menu topics are different from the sorry, from the, the US ones, because the mental model of South Koreans uh, might be different from, uh, from the UX, uh, from the US uh, ones. Uh, so I've been talking about assumptions uh, and how they may lead us to generalization um, and, you know, how that has so much to do um, with culture and, um, and um, identity. And well, in all of this, as, as designers, as, as in a way, creators of a, of a product of an experience or such, re user research is really our greatest ally. And I wanna bring another example here uh, of, a, of a company that I'm sure everyone here knows, that is, um, that is Starbucks. So, uh, Starbucks uh, opened in Australia uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, however, in 2008, they closed more than 70% of uh, their locations because they were underperforming. And what happened here was that Starbucks didn't take into consideration the Australian coffee culture. They just uh, understood themselves as a global brand and that, you know, it would be just one more continent and country that they would move into. Um, however, you know, that's where they were wrong. Uh, Australian coffee culture is very much influenced by Italian and Greek immigrants. And so they're much more uh, used to like espressos and double espressos and so on. And when Starbucks came, uh, you know, they offered uh, what we may know as their uh, typical products, a bit more like sugary coffee drinks that you take on the go, uh, and that might be more similar to uh, the U.S. Uh, um, behavior and you know habits. Uh, so that was that took that took um, a toll on uh, Starbucks um, as a business. Uh, however, today you might you may you will still see. Um, Starbucks cafes a little bit um, around the south of Australia, but that is simply because uh, it is an answer to tourist habits and expectations. So as a tourist, uh, almost anywhere you go to, you might find the Starbucks. You know what to expect yeah. from there. Um, but as an Australian, as a, a local, uh, it didn't really fit uh, what, uh, what Australians were expecting. And so... Yeah, what I want to say here is be aware of user's cultural background. As I've mentioned uh, before, it is the first time that the project is going in the right direction. Uh, if you're open for it, well, that's, you know, that already means so much. Understand the different symbols that define 
your target group, you know, in this case, what does coffee mean? Uh, what does coffee symbolize? And make research in order to get the cultural insight that will bring relevance to your business. And I brought you this quote because I think it summarizes what, I, what I've been talking about. So don't find customers for your products, find products for your customers. So understand what are the user needs and adapt your product to it and not otherwise. Yeah, this this in particular, that quote, um, mm -hmm. it, it kind of like, it seems so now after everything you just said, it seems so obvious yeah. to do that. And it really does like sum up what you're saying, but it also seems like the opposite of what you know, mid-century product design was about in the U.S. Anyway, that you know, products were invented and then ad men and you know, like marketing teams were then developed to create a need for those things, right? And and, and through advertising, which is now rampant and pervasive okay. throughout our lives. So it's almost like um, when it, with the way you describe this, it's almost like an anti-marketing. Uh, push that instead of marketing after the fact, you do market research before the fact, design research, and you design products that already have a market. It, it sounds yeah. like, you know, I, it's it's pretty radical like in a way, right? Yeah. Would you say? Well, yeah. It seems pretty black and white here, but, mm -hmm. you know, the, the thing is, it doesn't mean that by doing user research, we will be going to users and say, hey, what, what do you want? Please tell us. It's not about yeah. that. We have to go beyond that. Of course, uh, we're doing research for a purpose. We're not just, you know, exploring broadly uh, user behaviors and try to find something that can be um, produced and can become a product. Uh, yeah. Well, all this to say that we should be understanding what their needs are already with some assumptions uh, in mind, but that we, we are validating or not. Yeah. Uh, and, and we are understanding the context to then uh, with our expertise as designers, uh, create a proposal. And then that proposal should be tested. Um, and yeah, uh, so I don't know if it answers exactly your- uh, Yeah your question like um yeah like last century when when or for even when uh, when um when the car was invented i'm sure you know uh it was not being asked to people do you want a vehicle uh with four wheels uh with an engine right. and such people didn't know what that was um, yeah but what people perhaps knew at the time was that they wanted to get faster to a certain uh, destination, you know? Yeah. Um, so that was that was the, the premise and the, the uh, core assumption, let's say. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, there's, a, there's actually a question here, uh, a follow-up about Starbucks in Australia. Uh, mm -hmm. Here's the question. Was there a local coffee business in Australia that understood the market better where did the insight about the cultural origins of their coffee market come from? What was the the last question? Like last yeah, the, the, the last bit was where did the insight about the cultural origins of their coffee market come from? So in other words, wh where did this, you know, Starbucks opens a bunch of stores, uh, Starbucks in, in Australia throughout, which they do all the time. I mean, they're, you know. Yeah. It's their, it's their classic play, right? Um, and then they start noticing the, the, the returns are not paying for the, yeah. the investment. Yeah. Where, where, then, where then did they get the, this insight that, with the, wh how do they figure out the reason for that? I mean, they must, they, they're looking at their quarterly reports and like, what's going on? They're sitting in a boardroom in Seattle, you know, yeah. like, what, where do you, where do you think they they got this information then finally after the fact that there was such a strong cultural cultural trend for coffee that didn't have space for Starbucks? Mm -hmm. Where did that come I, from? Yeah, I, I I I don't know for sure how they mm -hmm. gathered feedback, uh, but they must have 
gathered feedback like in place and i know there were also yeah. some business analysts um in australia working with them um yeah it, it kind of reminds me of um there's something there's something in reverse happening in like mexico especially the urban the more urban developed populated areas of mexico like mexico city uh, uh, Pueblo is another one um, where there is a willingness to embrace Americanism, right? American mm -hmm. culture for for um, consumption. And so, for example, um, in in the U.S., I don't know how often you've been to the U.S., but in the U.S., I there's I haven't been to the U.S. <laughs> okay, we got to get you here someday. But there's <laughs> um there, there's a big big box store it's called called walmart are you familiar with walmart yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, mm -hmm. it's it's one of the biggest importers in the world um and i think i actually think their economy at one point their their amount of trade was actually greater than most developed countries like it was like number seven on the list right uh as, and it was just a private business but walmart's in the u.s have like they get kind of like a bad cultural rap Right, mm -hmm. like they're kind of looked down upon, um, and you know they, you know, a lot of people rely on them. But there's there's a lot of cultural enmity towards Walmart in the U.S. In Mexico, however, Walmart's actually seen as like a luxury, right? And mm -hmm. if you go into a Walmart in Mexico, it's like these they're beautiful, beautiful stores. They have like a grocery section that's beautifully laid out. It's like the nicest grocery store you're gonna go into in mexico and they have all these you know everything's pristine it's very different and it's actually seen as like a it has a certain cachet in mexico if if you can shop at walmart you're doing great right mm -hmm. it's like it's a it's a point of pride and it's almost like the reverse and now there are there are like tons of walmarts in in mexico um and i just think that's kind of interesting it's like there's there is this, and, and and another thing that goes along with that goes all the consumption that Walmart sort of represents, which is, you know, junk food, sodas, unhealthy, unhealthful, mm -hmm. you know, the garbage that Americans love and we, you know, we trade in all the time. Um, it comes out of vending machines and it's shoved down our throats to advertising. Well, in Mexico, those things also are kind of seen as like a premium because it's like more American. And mm -hmm. it's sought after for that reason. And it's almost like the inverse of what you're yeah. talking about with Australia, where there's a, in Australia, there's this like reticence uh, to embrace something like Starbucks because it's very American, it's very cheap and sugary, and it's not anything like European coffee. You think, think, you know, which unfortunately it just isn't. It's, you know, but uh, I just find that those kinds of, those are different, like almost inverted situations on mm -hmm. opposite sides of the planet that, again, I don't know if Walmart does that kind of research when they go into a new market. It's, it's I think it, it's kind of like a, it's a very strange psychological, it, what you're talking about is psychology, right? You're, you, yeah, I mean, there's, there's like, when you work in uh, UX design, you do need to have some notions of uh, psychology because uh, it's about how people perceive things and interpret and read and, and such yeah. so uh yeah you do need some um some notions of that and it's interesting that example that you're uh bringing up by i mean i i'm not gonna <laughs> just take some assumptions here i don't know why it is like that but obviously it's also related to the way mexicans uh look at american culture um, yeah yeah that's not, yeah, and again, that's not universally through throughout Mexico. There's lots of rural areas that, you know, they can't afford to go to Walmart. They don't live near an, an urban area where they can go to it, but it's um, it's almost, it's kind of bizarre. It's, it's, it's refreshing, in other words, to hear about a story where a corporate conglomerate that's essentially mm -hmm. trafficking in terrible coffee uh, on the one hand, and then sugar on the other, Mm. which is one of the biggest killers in the U.S. diet, right? Yeah. That they are not embraced in a part of the world. Like, that's refreshing mm. to me. <laughs> <laughs> so I just, I just want to, yeah, I just want to point that out. But anyway, I'll, I'll let you continue. Yeah, that was a good, it's a good point. Uh, yeah, indeed. it's a happy story. <laughs> <laughs> so moving on to the practical 
bit of all of it. What kind of tools and methods can we use to address cultural differences? Well, it couldn't be anything else but what I've been already mentioning. So yeah, um, yeah. user research, go where the users are, watch, ask, and um, listen to what they have to say. Um, and if you do feel the research, if you go uh, to the geography where the users are and it's, it's really outside of what you consider to be your culture, find a local facilitator. I have, I have learned this bit in the hardest way. Um, yeah. yeah, so again, um, while I was studying in Sweden, um, me and um, a Chinese classmate of mine, uh, we had a, a an assignment um, for a, for a class we were uh, were taking during our masters, um, and the main the main goal of the of the course uh, was to you know um, apply research methods, um, and in this particular case to understand um, a town neighborhood better. So there were different groups in our class, and each group was assigned a, a neighborhood of the town we were living in. So we wanted to know, you know, what was it like to live in that specific place? Is there a sense of community in that specific place of that town? Um, and so uh, we went to the place and we knocked mm -hmm. uh, on people's doors. Unfortunately, no one, um, no one answered because it was working hours. Um, and we thought, OK, let's come back tomorrow after working hours so we can actually um, find people and, you know, we thought, why not creating just some postcards, leave it on people's mailboxes? You know, they can start thinking about the questions we'll be asking them. Like, why do you like mm -hmm. living here? What, what is it like to live here? Imagine yourself living here, um, you know, for the next uh, years, decades, or is it a temporary kind of living? Yeah, we thought it was a good idea. We thought, yeah, but yeah. little did we know. Uh, that place they call it villas in in Swedish at least um yeah. it was it's a restricted neighborhood so there's no gate anyone can pass by but what actually happens is that only people that live there pass there so um strangers <laughs> uh, two girls going there and living postcards in English uh, although Sweden is a country where people Speak, speak English, yeah. It was still yeah. strange for them. And they saw it as an intrusion to, you know, to have people putting postcards with questions about why they live there and why yeah. they like living there and so on. Uh, and so that was an intrusion to, to that community <laughs> space. And there was actually one person that called the police. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, well, you, so look, was... you look a little dangerous, though, I just got to say. Yeah. Yeah. A little yeah. bit, you know. Yeah. Well, it, this, the... <laughs> <laughs> this makes me i mean i feel better though because i i went to germany once on a business trip and in germany uh well in new york i mean if you ever when you ever come to new york people just run across the road when, whenever they you know lights are red lights are green it doesn't matter you got to get across the street to get to the next block and people are constantly doing it jaywalking it's called right um we don't wait for cars we just walk in front of cars and pedestrians pretty much rule the the city right uh in germany that is absolutely well, looked down upon true. they do not like that i don't know what it's like in other parts of europe but there yeah. they i mean I, I was getting like in the us in sweden yeah. it's a bit more like in germany <laughs> yeah okay so you understand what i'm saying it's like or in new york um, not necessarily yeah. US, but they not only looked down upon it they like were judging me while i was doing it. they were like staring at me like i just committed a crime so <laughs> you know, I, I sympathize yeah, yeah it was embarrassing yeah but so anyway, well but yeah. yeah yeah this this escalated quickly uh well we didn't run into trouble you know uh we were identified as you know students we were doing a research project and we just were foreigners um mm -hmm. so nothing major happened but because it was also just a small project for for school but it could have been much worse like like Starbucks in Australia, you know? Yeah. Uh, so yeah. find a local facilitator if that is the case of, of field research and apply the, the method that, you know, 
um, apply the method according to the needs, like interviews, diary studies, or even usability tests. There are so many methods. Just pick the one that um, is most suitable for for your for your needs as well in terms of of project. Yeah. But in many uh, cases, we know it's not possible to go to the place, um, mm -hmm. and so don't just give up on research. There are still things you can do. Um, and I bring just some examples here, such as reading literature, you know, uh, even if it's in your own language, you can still get uh, a perception of uh, what's the culture, how is it like, you know, what's yeah. what's the plot that is being told in that story. Get in touch with the target culture design community. Behance is a great platform for it, but maybe find mm -hmm. even other local platforms where you can um get some feedback from designers in that country they know what is what it's like to design for such culture so they should be able to give you some input you know yeah. consuming media attending events watching some videos might give you some uh, some context to visit ethnic neighborhoods or even museums for example i just uh, picked the, the korean cultural center in new york as an example uh you know if you can't leave new york and you're working for, you know, Korean uh, culture, that may be a good place to uh, to go. Yeah. Um, another method that you uh, that you can uh, pick on is personas. So by working on the personas, you will be able to understand the user groups better. So personas are fictional uh, profiles, yet realistic profiles that map the demographic information, the user context, the goals, the needs, the frustrations, the behaviors of the target group you're, you're working with. So there's an example here um, that I've, uh, this is from a project I, I worked on recently. I just, you know, um, erased the, the names of the, of the company and so on mm -hmm. for, for, yeah, for contract uh, reasons, but here we map the main persona in this case, because there might be more than one persona, not all users are the same. Again, uh, we have a summary quote, basically like the drivers, um, the driver of the behavior of that persona, a little bit of background story that uh, justifies, explains the use of that product, uh, the life goals, the end concrete goals. Uh, in this case, while using the product, it was a, a digital product, a website. And the experience goals, how does the persona want to feel when using the product? Another thing, uh, another oh, method. Oh, just, could you just go back to the persona? I just had a quick question. This is one per person, right? One persona. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But how, I mean, how many for a project like, um, and I know this is, it's, a, it's hard to answer, but how many is a good number? I mean, how many is too many? Like, where's the right? number of persona to, to really settle on so you have a full a full picture of who your user base might be do you have a yeah there's no that? right number there's no right, right. number uh really uh it depends a lot, a lot also on the product maturity uh yeah. like for example here we were looking at early adopters because this was a new website uh so it was trying to you know um answer answer uh, the needs of people that were like having a innovators mindset like they were uh, already prone to um to to adopt this product as well okay. uh, so that's what we mapped here because the product was at a very early stage of its maturity yeah. so it, you know as it matures it may um it may have more personas uh, yeah. for this case here uh, we map three personas, so a main persona, secondary, and a, um, a complementary persona. Gotcha. Uh, but there's no right number. It might be one, it might be three, it might be two, it might be yeah. six. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. I was just wondering. I know it's hard to answer, but... Yeah. Um, yeah, so design benchmark is another method you can apply. And um, here you will be analyzing the, the existing products from that market and culture. This is the example uh, of a project I worked with last year. So I was working um, for a Japanese client and I was like, I never worked you know, with such culture. What, what do I do well? There was no 
room nor budget nor time to go to Japan but I still try to do some work you know um some some research um some desk research it's it's called some remote um research and here you can see uh different apps um so we're, i was looking at the, the market practices i was identifying the type of mental models and features uh that they apply and i was also identifying the visual identity of the mm -hmm. of the products and that that gave me a great like background to then propose uh my the design for for the product i was i was working with um the mood board is i'm sure uh, a method that you've heard of but it should not be undermined uh, because here you'll be exploring the meaning of color psychology and yeah. visual symbols uh, and this is extremely important uh what like in in um let's say um in um Far Eastern, you can see up here in Far Eastern um, cultures, green may mean fertility, hope, uh, life, while in Western uh, culture, uh, it means luck, jealousy, greed. So color is subjective and yeah. it's, um, it is a perception. So we should uh, try to understand what does that color mean in, the, in that other culture. Uh, and that can translate into imagery, color, space, aesthetics yeah uh, i think this well. is really key because every almost every semester when i have a design class we have discussion about color mm -hmm. and i mean in, in most classes like if there's any kind of aesthetic involved we talk about like color and i think it's natural to say well red represents love but also violence yeah. and you know black is evil white is truth and you know happiness and uh, but that's really not how any of this works <laughs> like colors have no intrinsic value and and i think this bottom chart really makes that clear because you know you have similar the each sort of section around this clock like um yeah so uh, each number around uh, yeah is, it's a different it's thing a, it's uh, an emotion so number one is anger number yeah. Uh, 84 is wisdom and then you have a b c d etc and it's different culture that they have mapped so like western american japanese hindu yeah. native american chinese and and so on um and you can see that uh for example uh wisdom in uh japanese and hindu uh is communicated through purple but yeah. in native american is communicated through or is perceived through brown which is that's, very different yeah, that's so different uh, so it's it's like a whole world it's also like its own discipline um yeah it really oh yeah color theory is absolutely its own discipline yeah. it could be its yeah. own degree but you know yeah exactly. that's another exactly. that's another story exactly <laughs> uh yeah here are just some examples of the mood boards i ended up proposing for that um product i was working with so obviously had to do uh with beauty care and and such Mm. Um, well, and we've been talking about culture and different countries and so on, and we haven't talked about language uh, so specifically, so we cannot forget it, of course. Um, mm. On a, typogra a typ uh, typographic level, uh, we need to pay attention to the font type, size, length, and we, when we have, let's say, an app uh, that was initially developed uh, in English, if let let's say I have here German and Portuguese as uh, other examples, if we are going to go to German and Portuguese markets, well, beyond taking into consideration everything that I already said, we shouldn't just translate uh, the app, you know, with Google Google Translate, uh, because the layout may as well just break. So yeah. you can see here German is a very like long um, language, like words are very long. And it's very yeah. hard to hyphenate them. So what was done here was that the button was repositioned below uh, the title. Um, uh, okay, I see. Yeah, Portuguese, uh, on the other hand, it's it's also very long, but it's much easier to hyphenate. So the button was kept on the right side, yet the card, like the size, the height of the photo and the space for the text need to be increased um vertically uh, because otherwise it will all just be 
shrink. You know, it's and interesting because you can barely see that until you really, yeah. you explained it. But yeah. I, I was looking at these three and I barely, I didn't really see much difference. And now that you explained it, it's much more obvious. But you have mm -hmm. to explain it. It's interesting that that's not so. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh there's you... just, I'm sorry to interrupt. There's one request to go back to the previous page. Just, oh. it's, it's in the Q&A. This? Yeah. I don't know if there's a question about it, but. Um, uh, Nora is asking uh, a question. Nora, do you have a question about this page that you were you were you were interested in? Maybe we'll let her ask, and then yeah, you can con you can continue on, and mm -hmm. we'll come back to it yeah. if we have time. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So on top of this, um, on top of the typography, um, it is also important, as you know as much as possible to hire a local translator because yeah. a local translator just you know brings all the context all the tone of voice and exactly you know what you want to communicate to the to the audience in that um in that uh, group culture that google translate cannot do <laughs> right yeah um and uh, well we've been talking about um designers and how designers you know uh work as well with the researchers or may uh, depends on the team may conduct research themselves uh we've talked about different product stakeholders yeah. and well if you are creating a team to go into a project of course it's not always possible to have this in mind but if you can do so because there are studies uh this study here called why diversity and inclusion matter uh, has concluded that teams are as much as 158 percent more likely to understand target consumers when they have at least one member who represents their target's gender race age sexual orientation or culture so because they're those people are uh, much more in sync and aware yeah. um, of of these different um Notions. Yeah, this is precisely why our students in particular are so incredibly valuable to the design industry, because they have an underrepresented viewpoint in the design world. So they are there. The, our students are exactly the kind of people you're talking about. The yeah. need to be the need to be at this table. So this is a great yeah. quote right here. Yeah. Great quote. Yeah. And yeah, we know that at least from I speak from my reality. Um, yeah, in, in Portugal and the, yeah. the Western world, we know that um, a lot of the companies are uh, dominated by, you know, by men. And so mm -hmm. that, has, that has a an impact on on the product and on, on the team and, you know, everything. For sure. yeah. uh, so, yeah, of course, diversity yeah. and inclusion is, is a topic that I did not developed in depth here but um yeah it, it's, it's very very relevant it's interesting because like in the design world and this quote this research here makes this clear that the dei isn't a political thing in design it's like it is part of creating a stronger product you know a stronger design process it's not mm -hmm. about it's not like pushing for diversity and equity and inclusion it, it gets a bad rap from a political standpoint, but in the design world, like we have to do it. Like, it's not about, like you've just made this whole point that we have to do it in yeah. order to make better products. It's, it's, it, it is not, it's a completely apolitical thing in this, in this context. It is just a design, mm -hmm. it's a design strategy, which I find to yeah. be very amazing. Yeah. <laughs> well, so concluding here and summarizing, yeah um because we're we're reaching the the end of the talk yes just wanted to leave you with this last thought so cross-cultural design is first of all questioning your own assumptions mm -hmm. uh once you've done that well embrace the cultural immersion um research the communities uh work with us experts and users from the target uh culture and although from at the first glance, you might not seem the the approach to take because it's just like we're taking uh, more time with research and there are so many factors that we need to take into consideration. No, let's just take this approach, uh, this um, 
like more short-sighted approach, I call it. Um, yeah, although that may, may seem easier, in the long run, it pays off. And I've shown that with the examples I've, I've shared with you. So prioritize uh, flexibility, at least to some uh, extent. And uh, thank you all for listening. Thank you, David, for uh, for the invite. Of course, uh, this was great. Know if some some questions. I, I actually have one question, which goes into what you were just saying, which is that um, this kind of research, right? You're doing really intense user research down to like really like cultural practices and mental models of things must mm -hmm. cost money, right? I mean, it, it's part of the budget, right? Roughly, I mean, it, what, I mean, uh, and I'm talking about averages here, roughly how much would you say of a total project budget would really adequate cultural research cost? If you had to throw out a range or a number, what would it might, what might it be? Oh, that's really tough for me, I must it's say. It's a tough one. <laughs> It's a tough one. I I, uh, I know it in time, uh, like uh, timeline. Um, yeah. Right in terms of time, in terms of how long it takes. Yeah. Yeah. I don't yeah. know. Like uh, less less than a like if we're taking design and development into consideration, this is like a tiny bit. Okay. Like, okay. Uh, it's hard to say a number. Maybe ten yeah. percent of. Let's say okay. Um, yeah, a small sliver of the whole pie yeah. chart. Yeah, okay. because you don't actually like you know. Again, this is then a whole other world. Like there are different kinds of research depending on what's your goal. Um, there's qualitative and there's quantitative, and you know it's again a, a, a whole discipline as well. Um, but in the beginning, uh, when you are trying to you know. Uh, map the the whys um instead of the house uh that's more qualitative you can just for example talk with five users from each target group um so if you have like a one hour uh interview mm -hmm. uh, with each one of them well it will be like you know 15 hours plus the time to um to prepare to to do yeah. the rest of the research uh and so on so it doesn't have to be you know <laughs> this uh this um idea we may, may have into our minds that it's like the researcher that packs all the things goes into the jungle and yeah uh, no it doesn't have to swings be like from that. a vine right yeah exactly we're in 2022 and um, yeah we may even do it remotely uh okay so it it does not have to be that costly. Gotcha. Okay. That that plays into my other question, which was like, how do you convince clients to spend time doing it? I mean, if it, it seems like you're a pretty good person to convince them because all you have to do is <laughs> tell tell them like a few horror stories of where it wasn't done and the negative effects of it. But yeah. Well, I'm not gonna lie, like sometimes it's just impossible to convince them. They come, yeah. they come with a budget. I want to do this, and this is yeah. only, and that's that's it. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but many of the clients also come to us because they're looking for our insight. Right. So I explain to them why this is important and this how, how we get there. Uh, of course, if we're talking uh, about uh, a very small a company with a very, very small budget that wants to do research and, you know, uh, put an app out in the market and develop it. Yeah, it, there are no miracles, let's say. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a good way to put it. At, yeah. the end, at the end of the day, it's, it's a business. Um, yeah. And yeah, there's profit and there is, you know, um, but Clients that come to us uh, with a they are a bit um, less 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 strict strict. Um, it's easier to to manage them, but otherwise, yeah, yeah. Um, the clients that come to us and just say, "Okay, I want this." What we usually do is, "Okay, we go with you know we go with your plan." Uh, 
And usually the client is happy with our work. And now what we do is, okay, what's next? What if you think about this? So we've gained their confidence uh, yeah, and right. start, um, you know, suggesting some more. Um, some user research, yeah. Yeah. That, yeah, that makes sense. Well, this has been great. I thank you, Sophia, for meeting with us um, so late on your end. Um, I want to thank yeah, it's everybody been for. Great. It's yeah, this has been awesome. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, join us, please, everybody, uh, next week, same day, same time. Um, we're, we'll be having the second uh, talk in this series and continuing this theme of cross cultural design. We'll be talking about it in a few different angles from a few different directions. Uh, and other than that, Sophia, please get some sleep, <laughs> sleep, sleep well, and oh, thank, uh, you. thank you again. And and if um, if anybody, if any students or faculty or anyone here has any questions for you, would you mind if I send yeah. them your? Uh... Of course, yes. Uh, I'll be sharing my presentation, and my contacts are there. So feel free to reach out to me uh, with some comment, with some question. Yeah, I'm open, Great. and I'd like to get your feedback too. So. Awesome. All right. Thank you, everybody. Everybody have a good night. Thanks again. Thank Sophia. you. Bye-bye. All right.